welcome back everybody well I think we've got a live one again not sure why apologize for that but uh, every now and then things get a little staticky I guess we'd like to ask you to turn with us to 185 or watch the words overhead there's a song in the air let's stand together as we sing shall we there's a song in the air there's a star in the sky there's a mother's deep prayer and a baby's low cry and the star rains its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger of bethlehem cradles a king there's a tumult of joy for the wonderful birth for the virgin sweet boy is the lord of the earth may the star reigns its fire while the beautiful sing for the manger swept over the world. Every hearth is aflame and a beautiful scene in the homes of the nations that Jesus is King. We rejoice in the light and we echo the song that comes down It's certainly good to have all of you back this evening. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Tom, if you would, please. Amen. You may be seated. for you, rise up shepherd and follow. Shepherd, rise up and 
In case you were taking a nap this afternoon and needed to wake up. <laughs> Not sure what I've got here. Let's sing what 214 together, followed by 216. Oh, sing a song of Bethlehem. 214 is, isn't he? Let's stand once together. Bethlehem. If you're not familiar with it, I hope you will be by the time we finish. Oh, sing a song of Bethlehem. Oh, sing a song of Bethlehem, of shepherds watching there, and of the news that came to them from angels in the Calvary is 
so much. Please be seated. I'm going to suggest you use your lapel mic and return this one on. I kind of like the fireworks. I don't know about you. thought we were giving Florence a 21-gun salute this morning when she was singing. But uh, good to have all of you here this evening. Just quickly before Jack comes with our uh, missions letter, don't forget the activities of the week with uh, men's prayer meeting Tuesday morning at 830 and ladies at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we'll have our regular activities. Uh, we'll be in here at 6 o'clock for our adult Bible study. We've been doing a DVD series uh, by Ken Ham and uh, having some discussion with that and have thoroughly enjoyed that. So we will continue that this, uh, Wednesday evening. And then uh, don't forget all of the sign-up sheets for the uh, Christmas, uh, the choir Christmas party, the Christmas sing-along on the 18th, uh, all of those things. Please make sure you're aware of that. And again, if you are wanting to support a child at uh, Carriage Town. It is $40, and uh, our goal is to, uh, as a church, support as many as we can. So we're pretty excited about that. But uh, Jack, if you would come and read a letter for us. Here. Can you imagine uh, having a house full of kids anywhere from a few months old to teenagers, 10 or 12 of them? You'd appreciate uh, a couple like this. And this is from the Baptist Children's Home. And these are relief house parents. So this is their, their uh, story. We are so excited to introduce ourselves as the new relief house parent staff with Baptist Children's Home. We are Cody and Angela Noble, and our daughter's name is, is Lily. Lily is 18 months old and loves taking risks. One of her favorite things to do is jump off anything and everything. While Lily is an active toddler, she can also sit and listen to books being read to her over and over again. It seems that Cody's love for music has trickled down to our daughter as she will sing and dance and dance and sing. Cody and I have been married for just over three years now and are thrilled to be able to work alongside each other in full-time ministry. The beginning of our relationship started at a gathering my brother put together when he came home for college to announce his engagement. I saw Cody sitting on the couch and went over and started asking him deep questions. Little did I know that God intended to use my curiosity and need to know how and why people think to lead me to my partner for life. When Cody and I received the information about a serving opportunity with Baptist Children's Home, we thought that it was a joke. Us. How could God possibly use us in that way? Well, we initially laughed the recommendation off. A day later, we undoubtedly knew that God was calling us and that we needed to obey. While we were being obedient to God, we were both uh, unsure that we were truly qualified for such an amazing ministry, and were open to minded, open-minded to all that God had to teach us in the process of applying. As we began the process in June, it was immediate that, was immediate that God began teaching us and showing us that while we had faith in Him, we needed more faith that He can do great works through us. Our open-mindedness to learn extended farther than we anticipated and we were brought on staff officially at the end of August. Whoa, God did just not, God did not just to, uh, want to teach us something through the process of applying, but now as Baptist Children's Home staff and learning to continue is continuing to be done. September has been an exciting month with getting to know both the kids and our co-workers. For the month of September, we have done a lot of classroom type learning but the best learning has come from shadowing each, each set of house parents and seeing daily routines in a more tangible way. It has been a great introduction to each of the child's lives and a great way to learn our new role as we strive to minister to not only the kids, but also the primary house parents. We thank you so, so much for all this, your support and prayers. Here are some ways you continue to pray for us. Lily's ability to adjust to a life on the go. For grace and understanding that we are learning, growing, and serving in new ways in a different environment, that we may serve selflessly and with an attitude of love. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom 
for many. This is from the nobles. So you pray for them. It's a big job to uh, not only to be house parents, but to step in for a period of time and, and take over and, and uh, work with the kids. I know years ago we went to St. Louis Children's Home and to do some work paying, and just a few of the kids, they just wanted to be by you, wanted to be loved, just talk to you and find out some things. So you pray for these house parents and also for the kids. For one reason or another, uh, they have to be there. So you pray for them. Also, and men, you can come forward. Also, in the bulletin, you see about the Romaine's little little girl who uh, has some uh, uh, physical problems that they hope uh, she doesn't have to have any further surgery or anything like that. So you pray for little Mina that uh, that uh, things will work out where God will heal her her little hips there, and they they uh, won't need to have surgery. Let's pray. Father, again, we just want to thank you so much for the blessings that you bestow upon us. For those who uh, love young people so much that they're willing to give full-time service, Father, to to uh, take care of some young people that have uh, been orphaned or abandoned for one reason or another. I pray that you'll be with, with uh, this young couple as they uh, give relief to the, the full-time house parents, Heavenly Father, and for the prayer requests that they uh, they ask for, for little Lily that she'll adopt well. And, so uh, that uh, uh, she will grow up to be uh, normal and healthy, and we'll thank you for that, Father. I pray that you'll be a little minor that, uh, that uh, as she has some uh, problems with, physical problems with her uh, uh, hips, Father, that uh, that will straighten out and without any uh, further need for surgery or anything like that. I pray, Father, for all our missionaries that you will be with them and close uh, to them, Father, and give them good health, protect them, Father. I pray that you'll meet their needs. And Father, many of our missionaries are uh, new to the field and need to learn the language and culture of the, the country they're in. I pray that you'll uh, be with them in a special way. Now, Father, I pray that you would uh, bless this offering. Father, I pray it will be used to bring honor and glory to your name. For it's in your name we pray. Tell it on the mountain. Thank you, Bonnie. We appreciate that this evening. Let's sing Emmanuel, shall we? 201 in your hymnal if you'd like to look at it.
Thank you, gentlemen. Probably one of the favorites of all time in any hymn book. Love the Christmas songs. All right, let's go to Job, if you will. We are going to skim through Job 11, 12, 13, and 14 this evening. All right, and we are looking at uh, his... Job's third friend, his name is Zophar, and he's going to be talking to Job in our lesson tonight. And Zophar, uh, Zophar's first speech is not going to be very long, uh, but what he lacks in length he makes up for in animosity because he was a very angry person. He was angry with Job that God would dare uh, talk uh, that Job would dare talk about God in the way that he had and you know there is certainly a time for righteous anger but on the ash heap where Job was was certainly not the place and it was not the time uh, Job was looking for a helping hand and instead Zophar gave him a, a slap in the face and Zophar makes three accusations against Job. The first one is that Job is guilty of sin. That was just a broken record from what uh, Zophar had heard from the first two, Bildad and Eliphaz. But look at Job chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, Then answered Zophar the Naamathite, and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should the lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. You know, after listening to uh, Eliphaz and Bildad, you would have thought that Zophar might have had a little bit more sympathy, might have had a little bit more compassion in the way he talked to Job, and it is a sad thing when people who ought to be sharing ministry instead are creating misery. But uh, Zophar opens up and he talks to Job. And basically he tells him again, just like Bildad did, he said, you are full of hot air. Look at what he says in 11 and verse 2. He says, should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? There is a Chinese proverb that says this, and it describes... Job listening to these three fellows. But it says, though conversing face to face, their hearts have a thousand miles between them. And that was certainly the case with these three fellows talking to um, Job. I mean, this was very true that uh, on the ash heap where he was sitting, they were right there within uh, feet of each other, but their hearts were miles and miles away. And Zophar says, not only are you full of hot air, but look at what he says in verse 3. Should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed. So basically, he was just outright calling Job a liar and said, you are full of mockery. You are a man who speaks without thinking. And, and the reason why Zophar called Job a liar was because if you go back to chapter 7, Job made several statements about God. Why have you forgotten me? Why have you neglected me? Why are you not treating me like one of your creation? So on and so forth. And Zophar just could not believe that Job would talk about God this way and lie in such a way. Um, 
He, he, he looks at Job and he talks about his purity there. Verse 4, For thou hast said, talking to Job, For Job, you've said that your doctrine is pure and that you are clean in the eyes of everyone. Evidently, Bildad and Zophar and Eliphaz kind of thought that Job, in maintaining his integrity, was kind of puffing himself up and making himself to be pure in the eyes of God, which certainly was not true. Job was not saying at all that he was uh, uh, com completely free of sin or anything like that. But he says here, first of all, that Job was guilty of sin. Secondly, he says that Job is ignorant of God. Look at chapter 11 and verse 5. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. Zophar was basically saying, God, why don't you come down face to face and tell Job what for? Just tell him everything that you think he's done wrong. I'm trying to tell him. My friends are trying to tell him. But God, why don't you come down and just tell Job everything that is wrong with him, everything that he's doing wrong? We know if you go to chapter 38 that God did speak. 38, 39, 40, and 41, God did speak. But God spoke to Bildad and Zophar and Eliphaz, and he rebuked them. And we also need to be very, very careful of asking God to tell others where they've gone wrong if we are not prepared for God to tell us what we're doing wrong. Um, but Zophar, he, he wanted... <clears throat> Look at verse 6. That God would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. And so what we have here is Zophar wanted Job to grasp the height and the depth and the breadth and the length of God's wisdom. And Zophar basically was saying, Job, if you can't do that on your own, I know it and I'll be happy to tell you. If you would just be willing to listen to me, I can teach you God's wisdom. And then Zophar goes on and he says, look, since God knows everything, he knows all about you. Job, you need to be lucky that your situation is not worse than it is. He, 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 Zophar looks at Job and says, you know, your life could be worse. Now, imagine how a person would take that who had lost his wealth, lost his health, lost his family, and was barely hanging on to life. I mean, the flippant way in which these three fellows were talking to Job showed that they clearly lacked understanding. And in verse 7... Zophar asks a couple of questions, which of course would re, uh, require a negative answer. Canst thou by searching find out God? Can thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? Job saying, of course we cannot know everything there is to know about God. But what Job did know about God was true and right. And Job was encouraged to hold fast to his integrity and not give up. But Job insinuated that, hey, God, uh, or Zophar insinuated to Job, look, God's not accountable to us. He knows who is pure. He knows who is holy. He knows who is sinless. He knows who is sinful. And Job, because he has punished you, you are ignorant of God's wisdom and you are not willing to, re to see that you are a sinner. And he, he gives Job a, a real slap in the face in chapter 11 and verse 12. This is an interesting parable. Zophar says, For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. Now, this, this proverb can be uh, interpreted in two completely different ways. And, and, and the first way to look at it is, is kind of like the um, Zophar is saying, no matter how stupid a man is when he's born, there is still a chance that he might gain some degree of intelligence. Now that gives hope for guys like me. But then there is another way to look at this proverb. 
And that is probably what most Old Testament uh, commentators and, and historians would hold to is this second definition, is that a, a stupid man being born can no more be wise than a donkey's young colt being born a human being. So basically, Zophar was telling Job, you are an ignorant man. You will never be intelligent to the things of God. Now, these three fellows were supposed to be here to encourage Job. And basically, Zophar says, you're stupid, and you're always going to be stupid. You will never understand the things of God. This coming from Zophar to a man named Job, who God said twice was what? Perfect, upright, feared God, eschewed evil. And so he says, first of all, Job, you are guilty of sin. Secondly, he says, you are ignorant of God. And third, he says, you are stubborn and you need to repent. Look at chapter 11 and verse 13. If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, Put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast, and shalt not fear, because thou shalt forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. And thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning. Thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety, and thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee. I mean, Zophar looks at Job here and says, you are a guilty sinner, you are ignorant of the wisdom of God, you are stubborn and need to repent, but oh, there's hope. If you will just do what I tell you to do, what Eliphaz told you to do, what Bildad told you to do, if you would just confess your sins before God and repent, then all of these great things, all of these great benefits are going to come back to you. All of your misery is going to be gone. All of your fear is going to be gone. It'll be like water over the dam. You'll never see it again. And you will be happy and you will no longer have to be afraid. Zophar says all of these things will happen if... There was a, uh, um, Zophar says, all of these things are going to happen to you, but you have to do it my way and on my terms. And that means you have to go before the Lord and you have to ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins. Now, we are not saying at all that Job was a completely sinless man. But in this instance, for all of these things that happened, losing his health and his wealth and his family, none of that was caused by Job's sin. And so Job was basically saying, I'm not going to apologize for something I didn't do. And that's exactly what Zophar wanted him to do. Because Zophar, Eliphaz, Bildad, they all, all had this thing. Remember, God blesses the righteous and he will punish the wicked. And so in their efforts to be helpful, they were saying, just admit that you're a sinner. Go to God, confess your sins, and life will be good. It was, it was a, a commercial type of faith that the devil thought that Job had, that if I just be obedient to God, he will bless me with all of these things. It's kind of like when Catholics go to confession, right? It's forgotten. Go do whatever you need to do. God will bless you. But Job said, I will not do that. He would have been playing right into the devil's hands. And Job was going to hold on to his integrity and not do what Zophar wanted him to do. Job didn't have a, a commercial type of faith. He had a very confident faith. We can see that in Job 13 and verse 15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. So, <clears throat> Zophar, that is the end of his first speech. And he tells Job that he's guilty of sin. He's ignorant of the wisdom and intelligence of God and that he is stubborn and he needs to repent. Job then replies to Zophar with three affirmations of his own. We see it in chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. And the first thing Job talks about in chapter 12 is the greatness of God. And Job challenged his friends and he he was not happy that they were declaring that they seemed to be wiser concerning the things of God than he was. 
Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? I am as one mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. Job said, look, what makes you all think you know more than me? Yes, you may be older than me, but there are old fools just as there are young fools. And he says, how dare you make me a laughing stock? among the community, which is what they had done. So at the beginning of chapter 12, before he talks about the greatness of God, he kind of gets mad at his friends and kind of of lets them know that I have some wisdom and some intelligence and some knowledge about God. And Zophar basically implied that there is absolutely no way, certainly not a stupid man like Job, could understand the higher things of God. And Job comes back in chapter 12 and verse 7. Look what he says. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Job says, don't tell me that I don't have any intelligence or any wisdom of God because God's creation, the the, the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the beasts of the field, they can tell you about the wisdom of God and the intelligence of God, so please don't tell me that I lack any wisdom. But then Job starts to talk about the greatness of God. If you drop down to chapter 12 and verse 14, he's talking about how God is sovereign over all of his creation. He is sovereign over all of nature. He is sovereign over people. He is sovereign over nations. Look at what he says in Job chapter 12 and verse 14. He says, Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He leadeth counselors away, spoiled, and maketh the judges fools. He looseth the bonds of kings and girdeth their loins with a girdle. He leadeth princes away spoiled and overthroweth the mighty. He removeth away the speech of the trusty and taketh away the understanding of the aged. He poureth contempt upon princes and weakeneth the strength of the mighty. He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. So Job was giving Zophar a sermon that God is no respecter of persons. And he said, God can take the highest and the mightiest and he can bring them down to nothing, whether they be princes or kings, whether they be nations, God is in complete control. So Job in his response was affirming that he knew a little bit about the wisdom and the power and the sovereignty of God. He was not, uh, Job said that God is not impressed with a person's rank or station or wealth or social status, nor was he afraid of it. So, first of all, in Job's defense, he affirms the greatness of God. Secondly, then, he kind of reaffirms his own integrity in chapter 13. And again, he goes after his friends. He says that you are not caring individuals. You are not compassionate individuals. You are giving me false information that is absolutely of no help whatsoever. Look what he says in chapter 13, verse 1. Lo, mine eye has seen all this. Mine ear hath heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Now look what he says in verse 4. Ye are forgers, or creators of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. You ever gone to the doctor before? It's like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. That doctor doesn't have any clue, and so what does he do? He prescribes me medicine. That medicine's not going to help me. That's exactly what Job says to his three friends here. He says, you are all doctors that are wrong in your diagnosis, therefore your remedy is useless to me. Job had just about had it with these guys, which is why he says in chapter 13 and verse 5, and we quoted this a couple of weeks ago, Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, 
and it should be your wisdom. And Job says, you know, I, I can't do anything with you three anymore. You, you are just not able to reason with. So he makes a declaration. Drop down to verse 13. He says, hold your peace. Let me alone that I may speak. And let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in mine hand? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite shall not come before him. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. Job says, look, I've had it with you three. I'm going to take my case directly before God, and I'm going to prove my integrity before him. And yes, I know that I am taking my life in my own hands, because if for some reason... God is not happy with me. If for some reason I have given a false indication, if for some reason I have lied, God will just kill me. He said, but I'm going to take my chances because of my integrity. I'm going to go before God. I'm going to stand before God. I'm going to take God to court and let what happens, happen. Job said, basically, what what do I have to lose? I've lost my health. I've lost my wealth. I've lost my family. I don't want to live. If, if, if God doesn't do anything when I take him to court, I'm going to die anyway. If God rejects me and gets mad at me, I'm going to die. But he said there is a possibility that God may see my side of it and prove that I'm not the hypocrite that you three say that I am. And so... Job says, I'm going to take God to court. Look at verse 22, chapter 13. He says, it's time to settle this, God. Let's take care of it. Verse 22, then call thou, and I will answer. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. Job says there in in verse 22, God, I'm willing to let you talk first. Let's just get this thing settled. Do with me what you're going to do with me. Because Job said, my life stinks. I have nothing left but my integrity, and I want to prove that. And so he says to God, let's get started with this. So Job, in his affirmation to Zophar, talks about the greatness of God, talks about the sovereignty of God in chapter 12. Then in chapter 13, he he tells his friends that I am going to take my case to court, and I'm going to prove mine own integrity. And then lastly, in chapter 14, his third affirmation is that he is completely hopeless. Look at what he says in chapter 14 and verse 1. Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Every one of us know that verse, don't we? We probably said it a thousand times. Few days and full of trouble. Verse 2, he cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Job goes on in chapter 14 and talks about his complete despair and feeling of hopelessness. Look at what he says in verse 15. He says, Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. Thou wilt have a desire to work to the work of thine hands. Job says to God, look, I know I am one of your creation. I believe that. But you are not treating me like one of your creatures. You're not taking care of me. You're not being any better to me than these three fellows that I'm having to deal with. He says, God, you are doing nothing but keeping record of my sin. You ever feel like that before? That God, you're forgetting all of the good things I've done, but it just seems like all you can remember is the bad thing. And and Job was a little frustrated. He says, God, what can I do as long as you are investigating me the way that you are? He says, instead of cleansing my sins, you're covering them up and you won't even tell me what I've done wrong. How many times have you watched a a police show and, and the policeman says, get out of your car, you're under arrest. And the guy says, what have I done? What have I done? That's exactly how Job was feeling. He knew his only recourse to prove his integrity was to go to God, and God wasn't telling him a thing. And Job's sitting here saying, how can I present my case? How can I prove my integrity? How can I show that I'm not a hypocrite if you won't even tell me what I've done wrong? And think about that. Job hadn't done anything wrong. 
And he's saying, God, you are messing with my mind. And I'd rather die. And he gives a couple of illustrations to prove that point of, of, of what was happening to him physically and spiritually as a man. As we close, look at chapter 14 and verse 17. He says, my transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up mine iniquity. What was he uh, Iniquity. I said iniquity. Um, he was saying, <laughs> so glad you all listen. Um, Job was saying, there's no way out. I am trapped in something, and I don't even know what it is. But he said, you are not even allowing me to breathe, God. You, you will not even tell me what I've done wrong. And then he goes on. He gives a couple of illustrations. Verse 18, surely the mountain, uh, surely the mountain falling cometh to naught, and the rock is removed out of its place. He's talking about here, he says, I feel like I'm, I'm in an earthquake where everything is completely messed up. Just like when Paul and Silas were in the prison and they prayed and there was an earthquake that just messed up everything to the positive. Job is hitting, sitting here saying, I feel like I'm in an earthquake and everything is messing up only to the negative. And, and you, you look at all of these uh, newscasts of, of, of these different countries or our country that has an earthquake and you just see the rubble, right? The mess. Job said, that's what I feel like. I feel like the after effects of an earthquake. And then he gives one more illustration. Look at verse 19. The waters wear the stones. Thou washest away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth, and thou destroyest the hope of man. He says, I feel like I am a stone in a body of water, a river. The, the water just keeps going over that stone and over that stone until that stone just literally wears away to nothing. Basically what he was saying is, God, I know death is coming. He said, you're either going to bring it suddenly like an earthquake, or you're going to bring it slowly like water going over a stone and wearing it down day by day, day by day. And look at how Job ends this. Verse 20. Thou prevailest forever against him, and he passeth. Thou changest his countenance and sendest him away. His sons come to honor, and he knoweth it not. And they are brought low, but he perceiveth it not of them. You know, Job was saying here, I feel like I'm trapped in a place where I'm here all by myself. And my family is all over here. And my family is doing this and that. And I don't have the ability to know what they're doing. You have taken everything from me. You have trapped me in my own iniquity where my family is off doing whatever and I can't even know what's happening. And Job basically at the end of this chapter says, he says, God, just take my life. You know, this book of Job is really in the guts of it a pretty depressing book. But there is so much we can learn out of this book because every one of us can relate to where Job was. Did we lose our health and our wealth and our family? Probably not. But we've, we've lost things that we never thought we would. We've been put in positions that we never thought we'd be in. And, and we feel like God has not only forgotten us, but he is the instigator of what is happening to us. And so every one of us that are of a, a, a proper age can understand to some degree what Job's going through. It's, it's, I mean, when you think about this, Job wakes up one day and everything's normal. And then all of a sudden, livestock's gone, wealth is gone, family's gone, wife says curse God and die. Job has lost everything, and he has no idea why. 
Then all of a sudden, here come his three friends who come and mourn with him for a week, and then they start talking and telling Job everything he's done wrong. Folks, we, we said this the other day, and it, it, it holds so true. Our explanations of a situation will never heal a broken, hurting heart. Job sat there and told these fellows in chapter 13 and verse 5, I wish you would just be quiet. They didn't understand his, his, his mourning and his grieving. They didn't understand it at all. Face to face, communicating. But their hearts were thousands of miles apart. Folks, let's be very, very careful in how we and when we counsel that we are saying those things which would be encouraging and that show sympathy and empathy and compassion and understanding long before we go into, well, let me tell you what you did wrong. Because, folks, we are not always the experts on everybody else's troubles. A lot of times we think we are. Well, I can tell you where you went wrong. That's exactly what Zophar said to Job in chapter 11, verse 5. God, why don't you come down and just straighten Job out and tell him what he's done wrong. And then Zophar said, God, if you don't want to, I, I, I'll tell him because I understand, God, your length and your width and your breadth and your May God help us that we would be counselors of comfort rather than counselors of criticism. Heavenly Father, how I pray that you would be with each and every one of us today as we are often in these positions where we are, perhaps we're asked to give some advice or counsel. And Father, to be honest with you, there are so many times when I'm talking to someone that I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say because I truly don't understand what they're going through. So Father, I pray in the situations we find ourselves in when we are given an opportunity to speak or to counsel or whatever, that we would speak the truth in love, and that we would be swift to hear and slow to speak and that we would try to place ourselves in the other person's position and try to understand what they're going through. And that, God, when it is time for us to speak, that you would give us the wisdom that we need, that we would be an encouragement. Yes, iron can sharpen iron, but, God, we would be an encouragement to those that we're trying to help. Father, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Folks, I certainly appreciate you being here tonight. I hope that you have a great week. Don't forget all the activities of this week. And if there's anything that we can do for you, please let us know, and we will do our absolute best to help you. As we are dismissed tonight, Brother Jim Berner, if you would please, sir.